Multi-instrumentalist, composer, and arranger Eddie Durham is one of the more influential and yet poorly known musicians in jazz. Born in Texas, he traveled widely throughout the Southwest before becoming part of the burgeoning Kansas City jazz scene, eventually working with Benny Moten, Walter Page, Count Basie, and many others, writing arrangements that became huge hits. He was also a pioneer in the development of the electric guitar and was musical director for the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, the all-women big band that emerged during World War II. Hello, I'm George Graham, WVIA jazz host and director of artistry and repertoire for Chiaroscuro Records. WVIA-TV has produced a new documentary on Eddie Durham to shed light on this remarkable figure in jazz. The title is Wham! Rebop! Boom! Bam! The Swing Jazz of Eddie Durham. The film will be shown on over 200 public TV stations nationwide. Leading up to the broadcast, I had the opportunity to speak with the film's musical director, Lauren Schoenberg, who performed with Eddie Durham for several years. He's also the senior scholar at the National Jazz Museum and is on the faculty at the Juilliard School of Music. We also spoke with filmmaker Chris Hendrickson. I started by asking Lauren to tell us about Eddie Durham. Eddie Durham was born in 1906, not far from the Texas and Mexico border. And he grew up in a world that was so, well, now we call it multicultural, uh, but there were so many people of so many mixed backgrounds and mixed stories, and the music was very mixed. And his brother had been involved, you know, with Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, you know, which is 1898, you know, with the, the Spanish-American War, which was just eight years before Eddie was born. His father played music. And music in those days had a functionality that it really doesn't have anymore. In other words, because, you know, of records and tapes and iPods and iPads and digital. Uh, back in those days, you wanted to hear music. Well, there had to be a live band to play it. And, and when people got together, it was to dance and to party and to enjoy themselves or maybe to be sad, to be happy, whatever it was. Live music was like the... Uh, was the springboard. So Eddie grew up in a world that was where music was so functional. And back in those days, for an African American young person, uh, not, and we could also talk about all the, all the other folks who came to America. But you know, you can never equate, of course, the the African American uh, slave uh, experience uh, with the immigrant experience. And so, they're one of the few ways out of what would seem to be a relatively caste system way of life for a young Eddie Durham, I imagine, because he was such a bright person and so much imagination. Uh, Eddie was always a yes. He was never a no. He was never a but person. He was a an and person. Uh, would be, I guess, to get into show business or to get into music or to somehow leave that area. So he j played in the circus. He played in minstrel troops. He played in all anything and everything uh, that could kind of get him out of there. And he had a natural talent for music. I mean, music and musicality flowed out of him like, you know, water. Uh, you know, out of a stream or something like that. Uh, and he played a wide variety of instruments. And so with his brothers and then with some other folks, he eventually wound up traveling and leaving that little area around San Marcos, Texas, traveling all around, for the most part, the southern part of the country, the southwest part of the country. And uh, his tremendous curiosity, I, mean, I, I remember him telling me once when he played in one of the uh, circus bands, they had French horns. And he learned about the French horn because he had to write music for a French horn. He didn't go to the library and take out a book. You know, I mean, he, he, he would have if he could have. But uh, he just probably talked to the French horn player and said, you know, how do you do this? And how do you do that? And, and kind of evolved into this. He also played, besides the valve trombone and the slide trombone, the guitar and all kinds of guitar-related instruments. And there's the 1920s, went into the 1930s. Uh, he started experimenting with little electric, little things that he could glom onto that acoustic guitar to somehow get the music to be louder. And in the early days of the invention of amplifiers and sound systems, I mean, he really was like a Thomas Edison type, you know, just, you know, experimenting and experimenting. I remember uh, him telling me that in the early days, you know, he'd be in the middle of playing and then the, the, police would come through his speaker you know what i mean all this kind of stuff or, or you know just incredible stuff you know uh well in any case uh he wound up eventually 
in Oklahoma City. And in Oklahoma City, there was a band called Walter Page's Blue Devils. And if you want to trace back the entire history of Count Basie and his orchestra, it goes back to that band. And in that band were the young Count Basie and Jimmy Rushing and Hot Lips Page uh, and, uh, and Eddie and others who eventually became members of the Benny Moten band. When he arrived in in that band, if you, if you want to read about this, Ralph Ellison grew up at the same time in Oklahoma City and writes about Walter Page's Blue Devils and talks about Hot Lips Page and how these guys were not just musicians, but through their inventiveness and the way that they confronted life as African-Americans in the Southwest in 1929. Don't forget what happened in Tulsa you know, uh, in, in 1920, 1921, that, that they were more than just people playing instruments. There was a philosophy behind it and there was a lifestyle behind it. And there was a, a confronting the world of those days in a way that was not open to most African-American folks. And Eddie became a genius in that band. And he began to write music that didn't sound that, let's put it this way. If you were to fly over Kansas city or Oklahoma city, you would see, especially back in those days, you'd see a little cosmopolitan center where the city was, but it's surrounded by fields and, you know, cows and horses, you know, a, a rural setting. And when I listen to Eddie play and I listen to those early bands play, I hear it. I hear the rural and I hear the urban in the music. And Eddie was able to put those sounds into what he wrote and composed for Walter Page's Blues Devils. You hear the sounds of Blind Lemon Jefferson, and you hear Lead Belly, and you hear Bessie Smith, and you also hear the very modern, modern jazzy things like the young Duke Ellington and Earl Hines and all these people. Well, Eddie started to write music like that. And the short version of the story is that the biggest, most famous band of that era was Benny Moten's Kansas City Orchestra uh, in Kansas City. Benny Moten was uh, very much involved with Tom Pendergrast, uh, who was never the mayor of Kansas City, but the political boss of Kansas City, as was Harry Truman. And and uh, Eddie uh, was eventually hired away from Walter Page's band, one by one, Count Basie, Jimmy Rushing, Eddie Durham, and eventually Walter Page himself <laughs> got hired to be in Benny Moten's band. And then Benny Moten made some great records with Eddie in 1932. And then Benny Moten died on the operating table in 1935 during a tonsillectomy. Count Basie took the band over. The band came to New York and boom, exploded. And that's the beginning of the whole Count Basie story. But when it comes to Eddie Durham, he had left already. He was, Cab Calloway offered him a lot of money. Come with my band, do for my band what you did for Benny Moten. But the problem with the Cab Calloway Orchestra was that it really wasn't a jazz band. Uh, it was all there to back up Cab Calloway. Later on, it became more of a jazz band. So Eddie told the story that one night he just walked off the bandstand. He left his guitar. He left his trombone. He does, you know, and he was kind of an itinerant guy wandering around. Well, what happened was his Count Basie's band became famous. 1937, 1938, they were playing a lot of Eddie's music, music that Eddie had written for Benny Moten's band. And he wasn't getting paid, and his name wasn't on some of them. So it was negotiated that Eddie would come in as the musical director for the Count Basie Band from the summer of 1937 to the summer of 1938. And he would write new music, and he would get credit for the things that he had already written for Benny Moten. And that's where you get this huge string of big hits. Sent for you yesterday, and here you come today, and every tub, and uh, jumping at the woodside, and all these kind of things. Sometimes his name was stolen off the label. Sometimes his name was originally on the label, but then you'd see Count Basie's name added to the label. You'd see someone else's name added to the label. But that really was when he when he you know made his biggest mark on the evolution of jazz. And at that same moment, he recorded on the electric guitar uh, the famous uh, Kansas City Six Sessions with Lester Young and Buck Clayton and the Count Basie rhythm section where he plays the electric guitar and trombone. And Nat Hentoff, the great jazz writer, once said, if, if the building was on fire and I had a grab from my shelf full of records, 
He says, I, w- I would trade the complete Stan Kenton, the complete, most every other band in the world for that Kansas City Six session. So that's really kind of like the high moment of Eddie, like in the in the evolution of new music. After that, he went on to write for Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and Benny Goodman, the all uh, the the sweethearts of rhythm. Uh, that really, hopefully, this documentary, for the first time, will tell a national and an international audience who Eddie Durham was and what he did, and we can start the process of getting this man his due. And I was just lucky enough to be around him and lucky enough that uh, that I decided at this point as I turned 65 that I really, one thing I wanted to accomplish was that there, there must be a documentary film about this guy. And so through the good offices of Hank O'Neill and Andrew Sordoni, uh, somehow managed to make this happen and then turned to Ben and Chris and this great team at WVIA who turned my wish uh, into reality, which I never could have done on my own. Well, let's bring Chris Hendrickson in, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, the experience you've had in uh, first learning about the music and then meeting some of the family members and uh, tracking them down and doing the the legwork that's involved with doing a real documentary. It started with Lauren bringing us the story of this in- incredibly yet uh, rather unknown individual who touched so many different uh, jazz artists over the years and never seemed to get a whole lot of the credit uh, that he deserved. And uh, we were taken by the story, even though WVIA tends to do stories that are rooted in Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. This was a man who uh, grew up, who was born in Texas, uh, traveled throughout the Southwest, spent a lot of his adult life in New York, uh, and so it, it wasn't really our story, and yet it was so compelling. We had to take advantage of the opportunity to uh, to, uh, to dive into Lauren's knowledge and his personal experience uh, with playing with Eddie when he was a, an older man in New York. And uh, we got a chance to meet uh, several of uh, Eddie's family members, his uh, his daughter and his two sons, uh, who are still are still with us, uh, and they were. They told us some amazing stories about knowing this man who really only started a family later in life, that a lot of this, uh, the experiences that he had in the 30s and the 40s was almost anecdotal to them. But they knew him as the uh, this man in his 50s, 60s, who was uh, a dad, who was a, a celebrated musician, a longtime working, traveling musician, and, uh, and came to New York to settle down to raise a family. And that's how they knew him. That's they knew him as dad. And and all of these amazing uh, jazz uh, artists of that era were were coming in and out of the house and they thought this was just a normal thing. But it was amazing to to talk to them and hear about what they remembered of Eddie Durham uh, and then being able to talk to uh, Lauren himself and some of the other uh, musicians uh, who had known him. Uh, over the years, like James Trillo, guitar, guitarist James Trillo, uh, and Chris Flory, who are, I believe, in the periphery of, uh, or at least in the orbit of Kiriskura recordings. Uh, Doug Lawrence, the saxophonist as well. Uh, all these people who knew him in a very different way as a, a, a musician, a mentor, a teacher, a collaborator, a friend. Uh, and then we talked to the family members who knew him as dad. And uh, it was something that was uh it's refreshing to see that he was exactly uh who he was at home uh out there on the bandstand everyone seemed to know that he was a guy that would draw everybody in would let them express themselves in the best way possible find out what they did well accentuate what they did well just like he did with uh bands themselves he would take a look at a band and find out what you had, find out what your strongest points were, and put that forward. That's what he did with 
uh, with the individuals that met him too. Uh, that was uh, an interesting thing that I thought was sort of a parallel and it was nice to see. So we were able to, to travel up into New York and talk to the, uh, the his daughter and uh, his two sons. We also traveled out to uh, Texas, to San Marcos and into Austin, Texas, where he uh, had all, uh, where he played during many of his formative years. And the, uh, the Texas State University faculty and musicians, uh, Hank Hemsoth, the, uh, the keyboardist, and Keith Winking, the, the, uh, the trumpeter, who are, are doing all they can to keep the music of Eddie Durham alive in the annual Eddie Durham festivals that they, that they put on. And they, they, do a, a, they, they assemble a, an Eddie Durham all-star jazz band that performs every year and uh, celebrates his music and it performs it, just like Lauren said. Uh, the key is to keep it uh, to keep people hearing it and to hear it the way it was the way that it was performed back in the 30s and 40s. You need to hear it the way it was meant to be played. And hearing it on a recording is one thing, but seeing musicians uh, create it on the fly is a very different thing. And we were able to see that with the all-star jazz orchestra in Texas, the professional musicians, and also with the ensemble of the Juilliard School that was put together to, uh, to record some of these Eddie Durham arrangements. Uh, and, uh, and hearing their impression of the music was wonderful too. It was nice to uh, hear, uh, there was a, a vocalist at, uh, at Juilliard and it was a, a Captain Quella. And it was funny to hear her say that Jumping at the Woodside was her favorite song when she was in high school. This is not the kind of reaction that you would expect. Love, oh love, oh loveless love Has set our hearts on goalless goals From milkless milk Uh, but uh, another thing that uh, uh, an alto saxophonist at Juilliard, his name is uh, Kelvin Walters, and he, he probably put it as succinctly as anybody else could. He said everything comes from somewhere, and the more you know about where it came from, the more you know about where it came from, the person that created it. Uh, it helps you to experience it in the way that it was supposed to be experienced. So it, this was an opportunity for us to meet uh, all kinds of different people, many different age groups. We talked to uh, students at Texas they're learning about now and how, how he had innovated a lot of what we know as amplified and electric guitar styles. Uh, this all came from Eddie Durham through his ab ability to experiment, innovate, figure out the best way to get the sound that he wanted, and not to just say, this is what I'm stuck with. If I'm playing a, a guitar and you can't hear it, so I'm stuck. Well, he wasn't stuck. He was. He figured out a way to make himself heard, and he's still making himself heard. And everybody who came in contact, contact with him was able to take a little bit of that uh, that passion, that experimentation, that creativity, and make it their own. But we also talk to other people uh, who have a very different take on what Eddie Durham's contribution is and the musicians of that era. Uh, people like Bob O'Mealy, who teaches at the Columbia University, uh, who speaks not so much as a, as a musician, but as a sociologist talking about what this kind of music, this kind of performance meant to the people of that era, not just the African-Americans of that era, but everybody who was there. It was, it was an, an aspirational thing. But for Eddie Durham, it, I don't think it was intentionally aspirational. I think it was naturally aspirational. Uh, this was a chance to see to assemble and see bands that looked great. They're all dressed well. They sounded great. The staging was terrific. Eddie Durham was a, a master of choreography. The show was the thing and the show was great. And it made people think this is something, you know, 
life is pretty darn good. You know, they may be playing the blues, but life is pretty darn terrific when you see it presented this way. And I'm feeling great. And not only were the African-American uh, music musicians playing with white musicians, but they were playing for mixed crowds as well. And those barriers tended to drop a little bit. I'm not going to go out on a limb to say that this was integration in any meaningful sense, but uh, but the, the barriers did come down and people found themselves excited about the music they were hearing and moving to the music, dancing to the music. And so after that, maybe what you looked like didn't matter all that much, uh, at least while you were there on the dance floor, especially at the Savoy Ballroom and places like that and places in Kansas City where music was such a huge part of what people experienced every day. But this all comes through in studying the story of Eddie Durham. This is how he lived. This is what he lived through. Were there any particular challenges in making this documentary that uh, that you um, felt you had to overcome? Well, a lot of the planning of this, uh, and I keep coming back to the, the COVID era, but a lot of this had its formative stages and planning stages at the tail end of the COVID uh, pandemic. And so that made uh, contact with people a little bit harder than we would we would like. Uh, travel, of course, always becomes an issue in that. But once things started to open up and we were able to get to, to travel to where these people were, uh, it became a real experience because I had never been to Texas. Uh, it's great to see the that that area and and so uh challenges again became uh what is available uh to tell the story of eddie Dora. and a lot of the visuals for eddie are uh, are fairly sparse because he is not count basie he's not uh already shaw or and, he, and he's not uh duke ellington people who have been chronicled visually and through pictures and through film all over the place throughout their career eddie was very much on the uh on the on the periphery of that he was on the bandstand but he was not the center stage for most of his career so it became a challenge of how to you how do you show who eddie durham was uh when showing who eddie durham was becomes tough to find. And that's where the the family, Topsy Durham, his daughter, and his two sons, uh, Eric and Terrence, uh, became very important in uh, providing pictures of Eddie, pointing us in the direction of film, uh, newsreel footage of Eddie. And it's always a, a tough thing when you're trying to tell a story, a uh, history uh, from, say, the 1900s, uh, early 1900s, uh, because you're really you're stuck with uh, finding archival material that maybe isn't quite as spot on as you would like. But when you start digging, you find some pretty interesting things. So uh, it, it wasn't low hanging fruit necessarily, but the fact that the family was involved, it gave us a lot of opportunities to show some pictures of Eddie uh, that maybe a lot of people haven't even seen, or, or maybe uh, people even, who know him haven't seen. So that was a challenge that becomes something special, especially when you know you're telling a story that hasn't really been told over and over again. This is in many ways going to be someone's first, uh, if their introduction to the work of Eddie Durham and the influence that he had in big band jazz. And so as we say with a lot of the things that we do at WVIA, as long as this gets you thinking, and if if you see this uh, documentary and it makes you say, I want to know more about Eddie Durham, what else is there? Then you can start looking around and finding some of the things that he's done and some, some of the recordings that he's made and the musicians that he, he performed with. And this could be your entree into the life of Eddie Durham. Lauren, I wanted to uh, touch on, I don't know how much uh, you 
experience you've had in working or uh, finding out about the International Sweethearts of Rhythm with regard to uh, Eddie. Could you talk a little bit about that? You know, one area that jazz still has a long way to go with uh, is in gender, gender things. Uh, and so many times, especially in the old days, uh, women were kind of forced always to play together. And uh, and even to this day, as we record this today, you know, go to all the jazz clubs, go to the jazz festivals. How many times will you see a band with uh, women as members of a regular band? Uh, as opposed to being one in a one in every 15 bands, there's one woman in the band or something like this, or a band of women all playing together. Uh, it, it's rare. And in the 1940s, when the draft started, I mean, this had been going on. There had been all women band. There was a guy named Phil Spitalny, who had an all girl orchestra back in the 1930s, was very famous. Uh, there was uh, Ina Ray Hutton had a band, but they were for the most part novelties. People couldn't believe it. Oh, look, there, there's someone playing the drums in a dress or something like that. Well, the International Sweethearts of Rhythm uh, eventually wound up with Eddie Durham as their musical director. And this was during the Second World War when so many of the men had been drafted. And so the personnels of all the big bands were really, really changing. And or a lot of younger musicians, frankly, and or lesser musicians who wound up in some of the great big bands because so many of, of the, the core of the, of the great players were being drafted. Uh, but this was not the case with women, obviously. And so there were a whole bunch of excellent uh, female musicians uh, who weren't affected by the draft. And so uh, Eddie Durham was uh, hired to be the leader of the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. And not only did he mold them as, I mean, uh, you know, he was a, uh, as Chris alluded to, you know, he was, he was, a, he was the guy who could, a great catalyst. And he could take any band and make it sound better. But here he had a bunch of great women who had never really had the chance to play super duper arrangements before. And Eddie approached it, well, he approached all composition for ensembles, almost like a tailor, great way to think it would be a tailor who makes suits. And uh, like Duke Ellington in music and like Eddie. In other words, he would look at the band, listen to the way they play, and then tailor the specific arrangements to that trombone player and that trumpet player as, as opposed to one size fits all. And so he started to write music for this band. And as Chris mentioned before, he was an expert with choreography. Stand up here, put the horn here, dance around for a minute, sit down, stand up. So it was a great show. The arrangements were brilliant. They were all women, and they were kind of a real sensation during the World War II years. But because there was no commercial recording going on for the majority of that time, they never really made records. Uh, and they uh, they were well known as uh, the, the things that Chris uncovered, along with Marsha, Eddie's daughter, who's also known as Topsy Durham. You see all these things of the they're at the Apollo Theater and they're on the bill with Duke Ellington and Count Basie and Cab Calloway and Bill Bojangles Robinson. They were huge. But again, like so much with Eddie Durham's story, for whatever reason. It didn't stick in the press's mind or it didn't stick in the in the musical memory. And now, uh, you know, some wonderful uh, historians, Sally Plaxon many years ago and more recent years, Tamir Carnoodle and, and others have started to write books and do academic research on this. And Eddie is, up until now, has almost been like the missing link. And now there's going to be this documentary that they can show and say, this is the man, this is what he did uh, with these great women. I'll tell you one funny story. I was playing with Eddie's band up in Goshen, New York. We, we were there for about four years. And one night, this woman came in with a saxophone. Big, big woman. Look, you know, She came in, and uh, she had a saxophone. And Eddie said, Lauren, you know, do you mind if she sits in? I mean, what am I going to say? No to Eddie Durham? You know, I said, of course, I don't care. And in my mind, typical 18-year-old, 19-year-old uh, male chauvinist saxophone player, I said, well, it's a lady with a saxophone, you know. What could it be, you know? Well, this woman named Willene Barton, took that saxophone out and the only thing, I don't know what to say. She rocked the house. 
It was unbelievable what this woman played. And I found out later that she was one of the musicians that Eddie had known way back when. And there I was. Uh, to this day, if you mention her name to 100 jazz writers or 100 jazz saxophone players, unless they know the specific story of, of women in jazz, they will not know her name. And yet she could, <laughs> she could, you know, just pulverize any band that she ever played with. So that's that's how I got to know about those things. I said, well, man, if there's someone like that, think about all these other people. And thank God there are some documentaries uh, out there uh, uh, about the women musicians, but they're very few and far between. And Eddie Durham doesn't really get his due, so now he will. So that's the story. Amazing. Well, let's circle back around to how you got to know and work with Eddie Durham. I was going to Manhattan School of Music on the Upper West Side of Manhattan uh, starting in 1976. And uh, I lived in the neighborhood. And around the corner was a place called the West End Cafe. And there was an incredible person there, jazz historian and, and great teacher, Phil Schapp, was running the music there. And I always told Phil, who passed away a couple of years ago, I still can't believe it, but uh, I always felt that, you know, he's known as a jazz broadcaster and all, and a teacher and a mentor and a, the, the walking encyclopedia of jazz. That's all true. But what he did at that club in the 1970s, and I was there into the early 80s, for my money, was his greatest achievement. There were all these musicians like Eddie and others who had been kings, featured artists, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Erskine Hawkins's band, Cab Calloway's band, Fletcher Henderson's band, and and lesser known bands too, and lesser known musicians too. But they had been really like in the major leagues, people who play for the major league baseball teams or or whatever. And the music scene had passed them by. And when they got out of the big bands, the studio scene in New York and all the well-paying gigs were not open to African American folks. And they were just kind of passed by and forgotten. And some of them were working as bank guards or messengers on Wall Street, just kind of scraping by. Uh, Phil found them and had jazz there seven nights a week and hired them. And all of a sudden, at least one night a week, they put on their suit, look in the mirror and say, man, you know, I was with Duke Ellington for five years and go play. And then because Phil was such a magnetic uh, kind of guy, uh, you know, people came and and Phil told them about the history of these people. And they never would have had that moment if it wasn't for what Phil did. Well, I lived around the corner and I played saxophone and piano and uh, I was available all the time. So when they needed a sub, Paul Lauren, saxophone or piano. Great. I walked down. And for me, I mean, I was getting an education at least equal to what I was getting as a music theory major at Manhattan School of Music, you know, and uh, and there I was. So it wasn't that I think I was so good. I think it's just because I was there. And I wound up playing with these folks. And Eddie um, took a shine to me and I took a shine to him. I couldn't believe it. Eddie Durham. And he had a gig in upstate New York and Goshen called the Orange Inn. And we were there every weekend for several years. And it was three old guys like Eddie, uh, drummer Hal Austin, and a keyboard player named Kelly Owens, and me, the 18-year-old kid from the suburbs. And I, Jesus, I, I, I don't, I, it's hard even to put it into words. Um, all I'll say is, I mean, there I was for, I don't know how many thousands of hours, if I were to actually to figure it out, uh, thousands of songs with just three other instruments. And there's Eddie sitting next to me and I'm kind of living the music with him. And I mean, night after night and night after night after night and situation after situation after situation. And um, it was like an infusion of blood or something. Uh, and 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 I got to know him, and he was as wonderful. See, with great artists like that, I think there's no separation between who they are and what they play. 
and he was Eddie Durham 24-7. I don't know how to put it. Sometimes you play with somebody, plays it, man, I love their playing, I can't stand the person. Or I don't understand quite the connection of what they play and, and who they are. It's, you know, but with a great person like Eddie, man, he was he was just Eddie Durham. So the way he played the trombone and the guitar, he was as a person, beautiful, soulful, relaxed, uh, looked for what unified things, not for what separated things. And my parents got to know him. And my parents were concerned about, well, you know, our, our teenage son, he's going to be up with a bunch of jazz musicians staying in a hotel. You know what I mean? Like, you know, with the, all the cliches about jazz musicians and all this kind of stuff. Well, Eddie, um, I'll put it this way. When my father passed away uh, on his bed stand, he died at home. On his bed stand, among other things, was a little picture of Eddie from Eddie's memorial service and uh i don't think my dad ever thought that he'd know someone like eddie durham i don't know if eddie durham ever knew thought he'd know someone like my dad and so it was a very very personal thing uh and uh so that's how i got to know eddie durham and there's a lot more in the documentary not about my story with eddie necessarily but it really fleshes out all the things that chris was talking about um, and I think it really does present a 360 degree portrait of who this man was and whose time has finally come. If Eddie was alive this year, he'd turn, oh, 117. He was born in 1906. So, yeah. Lauren Schoenberg and Chris Hendrickson talking about the film Wham, Rebop, Boom, Bam, The Swing Jazz of Eddie Durham. The film is scheduled to be shown on over 200 public TV stations. Check local listings for time and date. This is George Graham. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.